This is lecture number four, Traditional Life in India and South Asia. With the emergence of various belief systems in India, we are going to see many of these playing an integral role in people's lives over time. The oldest Indian belief system, Hinduism, continues to profoundly influence the Indian way of life today. In fact, much of life in India has revolved around the caste system, which is that social hierarchy that emerged in the early Aryan culture thousands of years ago. And although the caste system in India was officially outlawed in 1952, it continues to be practiced in villages across India. Essentially, this social system governs all aspects of people's lives, from social interactions, cuisine, and customs. The ancient Aryans divided people, we've already learned, into four major groups called Varna. Within the social system called the Varna, there were the Brahmin priests on top, followed by the Kshatriya warriors, followed by the tradespeople and landowners called Vasyas, followed by the servant class of peasants and servants called the Sudras. This system had its origins in the Aryan scriptures and holy books called the Vedas. Eventually, a fifth group formed called the Untouchables. Well, over thousands of years, this Varna system became known as the caste system. Many subgroups formed called subcastes. Castes relied upon the idea that there are separate kinds of humans in the world and that we all have our place in this world. It is believed that people in higher castes are closer to reaching spiritual enlightenment or moksha than the lower or the people in lower castes. As the caste system transformed over the years, it came to contain complex social mores and rules for the type of contact and interactions between different caste members. Over time, people learned to obey these rules in order to remain pure or spiritually clean. For instance, these rules often dictate who people can speak with, who can prepare food for other people, and even whether or not a person's shadow can fall on another person, believe it or not. A complex system of etiquette and manners developed in villages over time and helped determine who ruled over villages. The caste system has provided Indians with social stability for generations and remains deeply embedded in law, custom, and religious tradition in many villages. Just like we've learned in our Africa unit, life in much of South Asia revolves around village life. In a traditional Indian village, there is a headman, or village elder, who works closely with groups of other elders to keep the village running smoothly. Each village in India has traditionally been a self-sufficient community, meeting the basic needs of its people. This is really similar to the self-sufficient manners in Western Europe that existed during the feudal era during the Middle Ages. All villages had their own farmers, woodworkers, metalworkers, herders, and priests. Village leaders were often responsible for distributing land and essentially creating a sharecropping system within the village. In much of India, cattle are used for farming and milk. Over time, cows have become sacred to Hindus because of the essential economic part that they played with villages to help produce food. In terms of family life within villages, people lived with their families often in, in an extended family structure called joint families. These families included a husband or wife, their sons, their sons' wives, children, and any unmarried daughters. Very often, aunts, uncles, and cousins often lived close by. Most Indian villages are patriarchal in nature, meaning the father is in charge. The village system in India and the close-knit nature of most families will also lead to the practice of arranged marriages. Marriages were arranged to ensure economic stability and prosperity, as well as to ensure good relations between both families. Fathers will play an important role in arranging marriages for their daughters and providing a suitor and his family with something called a dowry. The dowry was a gift of goods or money as a show of goodwill towards another family for their willingness to take a daughter off another family's hands. This is similar to the practice of bride price in some African nations, remember? Except bride price was the money or animals exchanged by a groom or suitor to a girl's family. A dowry is paid to a groom's family from the bride's family. Over time, this led to males being valued over females in Indian families to some extent. A father with many daughters knew he would need to pay expensive dowries for them to be married. This led to, in especially many poorer families, girls never being able to marry because their families could not afford to pay for a dowry. 
The dowry system was officially outlawed in India in 1961 because it led to many instances of abuse or even bride death. Indian women who married would leave their own families to live with the families of their husband. Throughout Indian history, this has led to a society where women have enjoyed fewer rights and privileges than men. In Hinduism, women are expected to marry, wait on their husbands, and bear as many sons as possible. Traditionally, males were valued because it was believed that only men could engage in Hindu rituals, like the funeral practices and burying one's father. Much of this tradition is based on the idea of shakti, or creative energy, that women are believed to possess. Because women are the only ones who have shakti, it is believed that men must marry a woman to become complete with creative energy. This shakti was also considered uncontrollable energy that had to be contained. It was for this reason that Indian men were believed to have, to have the right to control their wives or to preserve the order within the universe. According to an ancient Hindu law code, quote, a woman should do nothing independently, even in her own house, in childhood, subject to her father, in youth, to her husband, and when her husband is dead, to her sons. She should never enjoy independence, end quote. Some Indian women secluded themselves in their homes, covering themselves, and resigned themselves to a lifetime of purda, or seclusion, in order to remain pure. Over time, stricter rules for women emerged, including rules that forbid widows from remarrying, and widows would, were often regarded as bad luck on a community. Many widows opted to do, or were sometimes expected, to kill themselves following their husband's death by throwing themselves on their husband's funeral pyre. It is Hindu custom to cremate bodies. Sati meant virtuous woman, and a woman who killed herself in this manner was believed to wipe away all of her sins as well as the sins of her husband.